My name is Victor Furman. Some call me the Voice. I've always been fascinated with human nature, spirituality, science, and the crossroads at which they meet. Join me now, and we will explore these topics and so much more with fascinating guests, authors, and experts who will guide us to Destination Unlimited. In 1981, the Moody Blues released an album called Long Distance Voyager. It featured a song composed by Justin Hayward entitled The Voice. The lyrics said, in part, Make a promise, take a vow, and trust your feelings. It's easy now. Understand the voice within and feel a change already beginning. The Voice Within We all have access to this when we choose to truly listen. Call it your instinct, your guide, your higher source, or simply intuition. Truly listening may lead to fundamental changes in the way we live. Can it also guide us when we are in the throes of anxiety and depression? Can trusting your intuition transform your approach to life and even strengthen your mental health? My guest this week on Destination Unlimited, Jill Sylvester, says it absolutely can. Jill Sylvester is a licensed licensed mental health counselor who has worked with adults and children in private practice for nearly 10 years. She's been quoted in Oprah Magazine and She Knows. Her first book, a novel entitled The Land of Blue, is the recipient of a Mom's Choice Award. Her website is jillsylvester.com and she joins me this evening to discuss her new book, Trust Your Intuition, 100 Ways to Transform Anxiety and Depression for Stronger Mental Health. Please join me in welcoming to Destination Unlimited, Jill Sylvester. Good evening, Jill. Good evening, Victor. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. Jill, let's begin by sharing the story of your personal path with our listeners. What led you to becoming a licensed mental health counselor? Well, I had been working with my intuition um, after my first child was born, actually, and, and while well, I was pregnant with him. And it was something I began getting really interested in after a series of dreams and um, just kind of having my own awakening, uh, so to speak. And um, I decided I wanted to work with it in, in some professional format, and so I ended up going back to school to be um, a licensed mental health counselor, and I was really interested in weaving that into the counseling process so that um, it offered more of a holistic and alternative um, bent for clients who were interested in seeking that kind of therapy. Now, in your life, have you struggled with anxiety and or depression? Oh, yes, absolutely. And that's that's really where the, 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 the book was born, you know, many, many years ago, Um and uh, and so it's 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 really uh, an integration of my own um, my own journey and also being on the other side of the desk, being a counselor and working with people who who struggle with that as well. And and you know m- most of us do um, in some way, shape, or form, some worse than others. But you know we, we're part of the human experience is experiencing anxiety and feeling depressed. You know. Now your first book was called The Land of Blue. Please tell us about that book. The Land of Blue is a young adult novel, um, but it's really a self-help novel for kids and adults under the guise of fiction, which I felt would be a great way to reach children and their parents, um, dealing with essentially the same themes of addiction and depression and anxiety. And um, so it's, it's a novel about a young girl, a 12-year-old uh, protagonist, Cassie, who goes in search of her father, who is who has gone missing into the land of blue, which is a metaphor for addiction and depression. And uh, it's her journey. It's about her journey into the land of blue herself in order to find him. So same themes, uh, two genres of books. And how do you uh, advise parents when they're giving uh, this book to their young adults, or the young children, rather, the adult children? Uh, how do you advise parents to approach this with them? Well, it depends on the age. I mean, the book is written for 12 and up, and really it's, it's a great book for adults as much as it is for kids. 
So if you're an avid reader, um, a strong reader at 12 and up, you can certainly read it on your own. I encourage parents to um, read it alongside their children or at the same time so that they can have their own little book club because it's just filled with opportunities for rich discussion. And then for kids younger than 12, um, I encourage parents to read it to them because there's some dark themes in the book, and certainly that's a way to connect with them and parent in your own style and, you know, tweak your own way and how you're explaining things to them um, and, and to read it together if they're younger than 12. Is this something that schools can adopt and use in their curriculum? Absolutely. We've had some local schools start to bring in the book for summer reading, which we're really thrilled about. Um, and really, that's the ultimate goal, Victor, is to have this book in the classroom because it belongs in, certainly belongs in an English classroom, which is a little bit harder to do um, in the short term. But, you know, wellness classrooms, that's really the place to start um, because, you know, it's a, it's a long book. And so you're not going to have, unless you're a really strong reader at that age, you're not going to have a child um, pick up a 414-page book or so and read it on their own. Um, but really in the classroom, if you, you know, you assign homework and you say, okay, let's read chapters, you know, one through three together and let's get started here in the class and creating conversations, that's where you're going to create some rich discussion with kids around these these topics, and really that's where it's at. It's the social and emotional piece for these kids. I mean, we, we, we've really got to get this going on in the classroom and at home. Absolutely. Giving the kids an, a, a chance uh, to, in their own community, in their own social group, to discuss their feelings and uh, how they react to what they've read. Yeah, and, and to understand that, that most people are experiencing the same things in terms of, you know, whether it's their mother's got anxiety, their dad's got anxiety, or they're experiencing anxiety and how they're experiencing that, or someone they know who has addiction, which I I would be hard-pressed to find anybody who doesn't know somebody in their circle who's struggling with that. It's such a relevant topic today. Um, so it's really, you know, creating a, a classroom where kids feel safe enough to share their experiences or their feelings around someone who they know who's having an experience with this and struggling um, and, and really, if, you know, if we want kids to learn the academic stuff, then we really need to cover the basics of, again, the social and emotional stuff. And I bet it creates great empathy, doesn't it? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And that's the other piece of it is creating compassion for those around you who are struggling and you may not know that, you know? And that can be in any aspect of life. It doesn't have to necessarily be tied to addiction, even though that's a great example in the book. Every, everybody's got their own version of the full catastrophe, right? There you go. <laughs> now, your latest book just came out is Trust Your Intuition, 100 Ways to Transform Anxiety and Depression for Stronger Mental Health. How do you explain, what's your impression, your definition of intuition? Is it an internal voice, a hunch, a sense of knowing, or a connection to spirit? What do you think? I think it's a compilation of, of all of those things, and I really think it's up to the individual person on how they experience it. So if you're a clairvoyant person and you see things in your dreams or you receive messages that way, then certainly that's your medium. For other people, it's a knowing. It could be a knowing through meditation. It can be a knowing just in your waking state, you know, those impression feelings, that gut feeling. Um, and so... You know, the book encourages readers to, to work on developing that and trusting that, that inner voice, um, that inner knowing, that inner sense, however it comes to you, and really building on that medium so that you can learn to, you know, flex that muscle a bit more. Now, through practice, is this available to everyone? Oh, yeah, definitely. You know, some people talk about having the gift um, and how some people have it more than others. And, and sure, you know, yes, there's many levels of intuition. Um, but I, I believe personally and professionally that everybody has the ability to tap into it. Like anything else, if it's something that you're interested in, then you're going to explore that further. Just like a muscle. When you exercise the muscle, it builds and gets stronger. Exactly. And how do you uh, describe your first experience that led you to trust your own intuition? Um, well, I mean, there's probably many angles of how to answer that. I think, I think part of it is, 
you know, growing and developing as a person. You know, I'm really interested in personal development and how we come to be the people that we are. Um, that's my guiding force with clients is really working on the personal development piece. And so, um, you know, through trial and error, through learning, through learning what works in your diet, through learning what makes you happy, um, feeling called to whatever your purpose is, for me, that's how I've learned to listen to my intuition, to develop it, to use it, to feel like I'm doing good with it, and to feel ultimately a sense of fulfillment, you know? Now, you have many, many exercises and calls to action and tips for people to work with and develop their intuition. What are some of the basic ways that people can just get in touch with that inner voice? I think it's a matter of setting your intention first and foremost. If, if developing your intuition is something that you want to do, again, we all have it, right? It's, it's learning how that message comes to you and spending some time exploring it further. So getting still, you know, setting your intention would be step one, and step two is getting still with that, really. Um, Being able to just kind of quiet the noise in your life so that you can start to listen a little bit deeper, feel a little bit more strongly, and, um, and start to build on it from there. I actually taught a psychic development class for many years, uh, and the first thing that I did was to tell people to get in touch with that inner voice by quieting their minds and practicing meditation, and we would always start out with some form of meditation, some mindfulness exercises, so that they could get in deeper touch with that inner voice. Mm -hmm, Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, agreed, yes. My guest this week on Destination Unlimited is Jill Sylvester. We're talking about her book, Trust Your Intuition, 100 Ways to Transform Anxiety and Depression for Stronger Mental Health. We'll be back with more of Jill after these words on the OM Times Radio Network. OM Times Magazine is one of the leading online content providers of positivity wellness, and personal empowerment. A philanthropic organization, their net proceeds are funneled to support worldwide charity initiatives via Humanity Healing International. Through their commitment to creating community and providing conscious content, they aspire to uplift humanity on a global scale. Ohm Times, co-creating a more conscious lifestyle. Tune in to The Practical Intuitive, Mind, Body, Spirit for the Real World, with me, host Robin Fritz, Mondays at 2 p.m. Pacific, 5 Eastern. I'll cover personal and business intuition, animal communication, mediumship, space clearing, past life regression, shamanic insights, energy healing, soul choice, and more. All to help you tap your own intuitive and healing skills. No ifs, ands, or buts. Imagine being fired because of who you love. Imagine being denied medical treatment because of who you marry. Imagine being evicted because of who you are. Millions of Americans don't have to imagine this. They have to live it. Because in 30 states, it's legal to discriminate against LGBT people. Get the facts at beyondido.org. Brought to you by the Gill Foundation and the Ad Council. My mother was very familiar with her neighborhood, but one day she stopped at the stop sign and she wasn't even really sure where she was at. When something feels different, it could be Alzheimer's. Now is the time to talk. A message from the Alzheimer's Association and the Ad Council. Back on Destination Unlimited, my guest this week is Jill Sylvester. She's the author of Trust Your Intuition, 100 Ways to Transform Anxiety and Depression for Stronger Mental Health. Jill, in the first segment, we were talking about developing one's intuition. And sometimes science, hard science, takes a a rather negative approach or attitude toward things like intuition and psychic development. In fact, graduate school in psychology seems counterintuitive to intuition. The American Psychological Association writing does not lend itself to trusting one's gut. Did you have to shut off your intuition while working toward your degree, or did you learn new ways to use it? Um, I think it's you know, honoring the left brain when you need it, which is, you know, to study and get a master's degree and and certainly work on that clinical piece. 
And then, yes, being able to shut that down and, and open to the right brain and tap into that when you need guidance from that side. So it's, it's not too much of one or the other, but learning to honor both. Now, there are a lot of people who are left brain and a lot of people who are right brained and some who have the balance between the two. How do you take someone who's mostly left brained and have them sort of switch sides and develop their intuition? Well, I think, you know, like we talked about in the first segment, learning how to quiet your mind and to trust. It's, it's really about learning to trust. If you think about it too much, it's going to be too concrete of a process for you and that can create, you know, a block. So learning to meditate, taking the first steps of breathing and being able to quiet your heart rate and learn to be still and quiet the mind so that you can learn to just sit in silence and tap into more of a feeling, you know, kind of third chakra stuff, right, versus the, 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 the brain um, and, and, and just quieting one in order to tap into the other. So it's, it's, it's a process uh, for sure, um, but it certainly can happen. How did you come up with a hundred ways to tap into the intuition? And are there more than a hundred? Um, oh, I'm sure. You know, I'm, I'm starting to work on book two to gather um, to, to gather notes for that. But you, really, Victor, it's it's how I live. So, um, you know, writing a book is certainly um, you know difficult in the sense that it requires discipline and and time and um, research. But it's it's how I live. So it's, it's really, you know, my own stuff that I use and what I use in session. So it, it came quite easily. So. And I, it also writing is a creative art and creative art is right side of the brain also. So I guess that your, your left side is coordinating the, 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 the activity of the writing and the right side is feeding the words. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, how may intuition help relieve symptoms of anxiety? Um, intuition helps relieve symptoms of anxiety because you are starting to trust the process within yourself of why the anxiety is showing up in the first place. And the hardest part for people when the anxiety hits is to ally with it. We want to get away from it as quickly as possible. Um, and that's really what causes more it's like you're fueling the anxiety. So it causes more agitation um, and more separation of the self. Really the best way out is through. And when you learn how to do that by trusting that anxiety really is good at its core, and I write that in the book, and learning to trust the message of what it has to say, which is no small feat, um, you, you, can, you can start to understand what it's trying to tell you. So if it's information about a relationship or a job or, um, you know, what to eat for dinner, what not to eat for dinner, what exercise to engage in, you, you start to understand that your body is giving you a heads up and, and, and wants you to be the best version of yourself. What about people whose fears or anxiety are predicated on past experiences and not necessarily based on the reality of the current situation? Uh, you know, I think, again, that's a process of, of starting to understand the, um, the relationship to yourself and your past and your anxiety, like learning to understand, if I'm understanding your question right, learning to understand how it served you perhaps in the past and what it's doing for you in the present to help you move forward to be that best version of yourself. So it's, it's, it's understanding yourself. You know thyself, right? You know? So it's just starting to, to come to understand how your body speaks to you. And so if you struggled with that in the past, then working to make peace with that so that you can help yourself and, and allow it to serve you in the present. Well, you mentioned, for example, relationships. Let's say in the past someone had a really negative relationship and that their anxiety is inhibiting them and preventing them from engaging in new relationships for fear of the same behavior repeating itself. What would you say to someone like that? So I would say, you know, you're, you're, you're looking to protect yourself. And certainly that's, you know, a, a noble cause um, you know, if you were my client and that was your issue, I would say, you know, let's start journaling some ideas so that we can talk to that anxiety and, and understand how it serves you and keeping you safe 
and what did you learn from that relationship? What do you no longer repeat? Um, what could you take as a message? What was the learning lesson? Let's try to work on, you know, putting it all together and tying a little bow on it so that we can move forward into a different space with that knowledge and that wisdom and then build on that foundation from there. Mm, yeah. You know, you talk about anxiety, but there's situations sometimes that the intuition will kick in and give you information that may not be generated by anxiety, but just you hear the voice, the voice says, do something, and you do it, you're not sure why, and it has a positive result. I'll give you a quick example. I was driving home on the highway several years ago with my family and uh, had no reason to believe that there'd be any kind of uh, issue in the traffic. And my inner voice said, get out of this lane now. And I just listened. I got out of that lane. And within two seconds, there was a multiple car accident that I would have been involved in had I not listened to the inner voice. Have you found other people having experiences like that? Oh, definitely. I could listen to these stories all day long. I, I, I love that. And, and I love that, um, you know, you, you trust with it without questioning it. You, you trust it, that part of you, um, without kicking into left brain gear, right, and, and um, to be able to say, like, well, you know, it seems okay, right? And these are the things that we do, but you, you, you felt it. You felt that sense of danger. You felt the message, and then you acted on it. So, yes, I hear these stories all the time in my office and um, just in people that I come into contact with. And, um, yeah, it's fascinating, right? Never never, never ceases to amaze me. Absolutely. Now, how can intuition help with depression? Um, Beautifully so. I I think it's number five uh, in the book where um, I give an example of my own kind of journey with that about learning how to listen to that voice because it is guiding you to higher ground. When you're in it, it's very difficult to, you know, ha- have a sense that you're going to get out of it when you're feeling depressed. Um, but when you again, ally with it, just like we talked about the anxiety, and join forces with it and dive deep in order to get the message, it really can reduce the time that you spend there, number one, and number two, helps you to come to greater understanding of what the depression is all about in order to help you serve and connect with your purpose. And it really is a beautiful process as as difficult as it can be, um, I do believe that's also the nature of depression is to to realign you with why you're here in the first place. Now, we, we always say whenever we're dealing with alternatives to traditional medical treatment, traditional therapy, that never instead of always in addition to, what do you do with people who are being treated, for example, by a psychiatrist with anti-anxiety and antidepressive medications? and trying to work with them to build their intuition? Oh, you can. I mean, you know, that's per- medication is a personal choice. Um, and if you want to still develop your intuition, you can certainly do that. Um, you know, sometimes medication can, you know, reduce the symptoms, but it definitely doesn't take away all of the pain. And that's really what you want to work with. So, you know, it's a tough decision sometimes to say, I'm not going to take the medication and just sit with the pain. Um, but sometimes you're better off. Sometimes, you know, you're not. It, it depends on the person and the situation. Just out of curiosity, do you work in, in conjunction with psychiatrists from time to time? Um, n- not as much now, you know, n- not as much now. But I do have clients who, who, you know, take medication and still do this kind of work. And, um, and if there needs to be connection interaction, then yes, certainly. I'm just curious as to how any psychiatric colleagues you might have respond to this type of therapy. Um, well, you know, it's not something that I've um, had recent discussions with, but I, I do think, you know, some of them are definitely open to this and so, have their own experience with so. so there is a broad-mindedness in the mental health profession, both in, in, in psychology and psychiatry, uh, about using your techniques, I think it depends. It depends on the on the person. Yes. Mm, okay. Have you ever had someone challenge you on this? Um, not off the top of my head. No. 
Okay, so you've been uh, fairly, fairly uh, uh, fortunate in, in the fact that the colleagues that you've worked with have never ch- uh, challenged the structure of your work in using this. Yes, yeah, uh, no. Yeah, that, that's a good thing. I, I think there's a, a need for more open-mindedness, not only in medicine, but also in all aspects of science, that uh, a lot of the great breakthroughs that we've had in science over the years have come through intuition, have come through people dreaming. I think uh, Einstein used to dream a lot of his stuff, and uh, certainly uh, Elon Musk and uh, people of that nature uh, dream a lot of their uh, creations. So I think it's really important that science uh, also embraces both sides of the brain, because uh, a lot of the great discoveries have come through that way. My guest this week on Destination Unlimited, Jill Sylvester. She's the author of Trust Your Intuition, 100 Ways to Transform Anxiety and Depression for Stronger Mental Health help. Jill, please tell our listeners where they can get your books and find out more about you and this wonderful work. Um, My books are on Amazon, so The Land of Blue and Trust Your Intuition are both on Amazon, and they're also on my website. You can gain more information from me uh, or about me at www.jillsylvester.com, and I'm also on Facebook and Instagram. I believe it's Jill underscore Sylvester, and Facebook is Jill Sylvester. And in addition to your client practice, do you also offer seminars? Uh, I'm starting to, to be open to that, yes. Wonderful, wonderful. And we'll be back with more of Jill Sylvester and Trust Your Intuition after these words on the Own Times Radio Network. This is OTRFM, part of the IOM Radio Network. Humanity Healing International is a small nonprofit with a big dream. Since 2007, HHI has been working tirelessly to bring help to communities with little or no hope. Our projects are not broad mandates, nor are they overnight solutions, but they bring the reassurance that no one is alone and that someone cares. To learn more, please visit humanityhealing.org. Humanity Healing is where your heart is. So I'm a cat, and I just moved in with this new human, and she's got this little toy she's always playing with, all day long. Tap, 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 bloop, bloop. She can't put it down. There it is. Oh, and get this. She even talks to it. Last week, she asked it for Chinese, and guess what? Egg rolls showed up, like magic. Humans have cool toys. A person is the best thing to happen to a shelter pet. Be that person. Adopt. Brought to you by the Ad Council and the ShelterPetProject.org. Have you bought into the idea that you have to work hard for your money, that business is hard? I will share some dynamic access consciousness tools to get you out of your own way so you can create a business that actually succeeds. Join me, Simone Millicis, on the Joy of Business at 4 p.m. Mondays Eastern. I'm Little Teapot, short and stout. Here is my handle and here is my spell. No, no, like this. When I get all steamed up, then I shout, tip me over and pour me out. (laughs) This is WWE superstar Roman Reigns. It only takes a moment to make a moment. Take time to be a dad today. Visit fatherhood.gov. Brought to you by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services and the Ad Council. Hi, this is Julie Geigel. And I'm Susan Schuler. And I'm Lori Walker. And we are the Psychic Angel Channelers from Angel Talk Tuesday. Tune in every week at 10 a.m. Eastern on OMTimesRadio.com. The angels have heard your call and are here to help. Are you ready to receive? Bathe in the beautiful vibrational frequency to help you heal, expand, and remember your magnificence with Angel Talk Tuesday. Back on Destination Unlimited, my guest this week is Jill Sylvester. She's the author of Trust Your Intuition, 100 Ways to Transform Anxiety and Depression for Stronger Mental Health. Jill, in your book, you say that some of this stuff is very basic, like the stuff we did in childhood. In your first tip, you suggest that people name their feelings as we did in kindergarten. How does this help as the first step to utilizing intuition for mental health? People have such a hard, a lot of people have such a hard time with expressing their emotions, 
and really it just comes down to one word adjectives and so this is what I, you know a lot of what I do with people is just get them to name their feelings and you know sometimes especially when you work with energy and intuition you really want to get to the essence of what is going on and you can save yourself a lot of time um, when you, you know, refrain from intellectualizing or, um, you know, kind of going off on different tangents by just getting to the root emotion. I am jealous. I am feeling sad. I'm feeling scared. I'm feeling happy. I'm feeling excited, you know. And the more you flex that muscle, the more you're going to understand um, what's causing you pain so that you can make your way through the emotion faster. Do you have any interesting stories to share about an example of someone naming a feeling and it had an interesting story behind it? Yeah, I think, you know, I started with jealousy because that was the first one I had on my mind. Um, I'm thinking of a client I had um, a year or so ago, and um, she was really struggling and uh, with the relationship and, you know, being able to work through those guarded feelings, you know, sometimes we're so, um, you know, shame, Brene Brown obviously talks a lot about shame, and and people can just spend so much time avoiding that emotion when really we all feel that way, and that emotion comes up for all of us in, on, on the path, you know, and so being able to kind of gently coax a person to really get to the heart of being able to say, I'm jealous, and in this case, you know, this person being able to kind of go go there and own it, it was a huge release. And once you kind of, you know, get in there with somebody and, and work on that compassion piece and let them know they're not alone, it becomes far easier to be able to say, wow, you know, that's what I'm experiencing, jealous or, or jealousy or shame, and being able to kind of just let it go. And when you have that huge huge um, revelation that that's exactly what you're experiencing, your body follows suit. So your mind lets go of that stress that it's carrying around, and then your body starts to, you know, relax and release too so that you become far more integrated, owning your jealousy, and then moving forward in it and knowing that it's okay and being able to, you know, move forward in that. How important is it for us to recognize that other people have these exact same feelings that they're totally normal and that you know we're part of a of a human nature, a human community? It's it's essential to know you're not alone like anything else, right? It's it's all about love and belonging. And when you understand that your neighbor or if you're a teenager to your classmates on Instagram who make everything, you know, maybe look like it's perfect on social media, when you start to understand that those people are struggling just like you with very similar issues, regardless of how they're presenting, whether it's on social media or at the grocery store, you start to understand that, you know, we're all in this together and it really makes going through the pain um, a lot easier, you know. W- w- with the book, when I when I wrote it, um, the first round of beta readers had encouraged me to write more of the personal shares. So there's a, a section in the book, um, uh, three sections. One is the tip and the tool itself of the hundred ways to transform anxiety and depression for stronger mental health. And then there's a section call to action. So it shows you exercises and strategies that you can use to implement the tool. And then I have another segment, not in all 100 ways, but throughout the book, scattered throughout the book on personal shares. And my first round of beta readers had really encouraged me to write more um, of those. And it's, it's you, know, you talk about showing people that they're not alone. So being able to say, hey, I'm a therapist. This is what I experienced before I was a therapist, as I'm a therapist. And again, how the theme of we're all in this together. Absolutely. Now, let's start looking at some of these tips. Um, you share an interesting tip on, a, on a getting out of the feeling of being stuck. Your tip number three suggests people get up or change positions to bust through the feeling of being stuck or getting out of an OCD pattern. How does this work? So as soon as you start to realize that you're stuck in a habit or stuck in a feeling, or stuck in an emotion that you don't like, and that's the key, is that you'll be feeling bad, and that's your clue that something needs to change. So it's basically the call to action in the book is about standing up immediately and moving out of that space. So you might clap your hands and move, 
or you might, you know, squeeze your feet. Let's say you're a kid in school and you're really having trouble at your desk and you're and you're struggling. I would say squeeze your toes as hard as you can at your desk. No one will know what you're doing, and you you break that cycle of feeling stuck in the moment. If you're standing in a room and you're starting to have ruminating thoughts about something that's driving you absolutely crazy, move to the left, move to the right, step forward, walk through the door in your in your office. Just move out of that physical space that you're in because it will absolutely change up that thought pattern that's making you feel stuck. That's wonderful. Can you give an example of that? Um, yeah, I, you know, speak building on rumination. So if you're sitting trying to work on something for work and you're stuck on something that somebody said to you yesterday and you cannot get it out of your head and now the you know, clock's ticking and you're trying to work on this project and you're getting nowhere... I would say immediately, once you start to feel that frustration, you don't need to analyze it. You don't need to figure out why that person said whatever they said to you. Push your chair back, stand up, and move. Get up and walk across the room. Get up and go into the kitchen and have something to eat. Clap your hands and move out of the space that you're in. Change it up a little bit. And it literally is like ripping out of one space and being able to move into another. So you're basically reprogramming yourself to let go of that negativity. Mm -hmm physical act first, and then the reprogramming ultimately comes as a consequence. You know, one of my personal issues when I was younger used to be that when confronted with a complex situation, I would have a tendency to catastrophize. I would see the worst possible outcome, but found that when, when I went through it, everything worked out fine. You have a technique that you call, and then what? A game to address this. How does that work? So it's taking, you know, the the... I, I, I write in that section, the anxiety about the thing is worse than the thing. And so it's basically taking yourself through an exercise all the way to the end of what could possibly go wrong. Because when we're anxious, it's the what ifs, right? It's like, what if this happens? What if this happens? And the mind goes fast and your heart rate starts to, you know, in, increase and you get yourself all worked up. So when you ask yourself a series of questions, like I use the example of having a sick child who doesn't want to school for fear they're going to go to school because they're afraid they're going to, you know, vomit, um, you say, okay, so if you went to school and got sick, what would happen? And they say, well, you know, it would make a mess in the classroom. Okay, then what would happen? Well, it would get cleaned up. And then what would happen? I'd go to the nurse. Then what would happen? I'd come home and you'd take care of me. And it's like, yeah, and everything would be okay. So when you walk yourself through, it's almost like having a dress rehearsal for your anxiety. You take yourself through to the worst case scenario and lead yourself out of it so that you get to higher ground. It gives yourself just like a dry run to see that really it's, it's, everything's going to be okay. Mm. That's great, especially for children. I think it's a wonderful idea. Thank you for that. You know, I love the movie Network, and one of my favorite parts was when Peter Finch's character, news anchor Howard Beale, instructs his viewers to go to their windows, stick out their heads, and exclaim, I'm mad as hell and I'm not going to take this anymore. Your call to action number four has a similar refrain. Please share it with us. Um, so number four is state out loud, we're not doing that anymore. And that's become one of my favorite mantras in the 30 years that I've been doing this personal development work. So, you know, again, when you're in a space that you don't like and the feeling will be the clue, immediately say to yourself, we're not doing this anymore. So let's say your addiction is eating too many chips. And so you're eating chips, you're working on a deadline for work, and you realize you've gone through, you know, half the bag already, and you're really getting agitated with yourself. Instead of beating yourself up, instead of continuing the habit, just stop and say, we're not doing this anymore. We are not doing this anymore. And what happens is it, it helps those neurotransmitters that are so used to firing in a certain direction in certain habits to be able to stop and say, okay, so we're not doing that anymore. What are we doing? So maybe I need to go eat something better for myself. Maybe I need to put the food away entirely. Maybe I need to get up and walk around. And maybe I need to stop this project and take some creative space so I can come back to it um, with, with a better mindset. Now, can this technique be applied in a group environment? For example, a work situation where people have a meeting to plan things and they always get distracted and start arguing. Is that something that could be effective there? Oh, yeah, that's, yeah, absolutely. I, I, you know, in the workspace and certainly in family dynamics, 
So when things are getting heated and, and you know, everything seems out of control, just to have one person say, we're not doing this anymore, it just stops everything so that you have to think of a different strategy. So if we're not doing that anymore, what are we doing? Maybe everybody needs to circle back and come back to this with better energy. Maybe everybody needs to take a step back and realizing how they're just firing off derogatory comments to other members of the group or other members of the family, and that's really not what our higher self wants us to do. You know, so just stepping back and, and getting a sense of um, what would be a better option. And you have the one naysayer in the group says, okay, what are we going to do? Tell, them, tell me what we're going to do. How would you respond to that person? I would say, I don't know, but let's sit here until we do know. And maybe someone comes up with something, or maybe you just step back and you come up with it yourself. But anything is better than the chaos that keeps us running in the same place. And again, what would the expression be? Uh, We're not doing that anymore. We're not doing that anymore. My guest is Jill Sylvester. She's the author of Trust Your Intuition, 100 Ways to Transform Anxiety and Depression for Stronger Mental Health. And we'll be back with more of Jill after these words on the OM Times Radio Network. Ascending Hearts is no ordinary dating site, but a spiritual dating site with a purpose, to link you with your soulmate. We engineer the serendipity so you can trust that you will attune with someone that has the same matching vibration as you. Ascending Hearts, the conscious dating site for the spiritually aware. Try Ascending Hearts for free, ascendinghearts.com. Change and growth are part of natural life and also part of your spiritual life. Everyone needs support and guidance, especially during life passages. Upgrade yourself with the Ohm Times Experts program. With Ohm Times Experts, you have access to the best intuitive coaches, spiritual teachers, counselors, astrologists, and oracles. Our team was carefully selected so you can trust. Find out more at experts.ohmtimes.com. Looking for inspiration? Want to be inspired? Not sure where to go. Find Mark and Kim every Wednesdays at 3 p.m. Eastern on Inspired Living. Topics will elevate consciousness and range from metaphysics to the human and social experience and all things spiritual. Welcome to an inspired community that offers support, encouragement, and new ways of thinking. You are are the the inspired inspired and the the inspiration. inspiration. Hi, I'm Kelly Fox, host and astrologer of The Astrology Show. Each week, I'll give you access to the current transits, which are a valuable tool that provide astrological information to help unlock the potential each of us has. Understanding the stars can help steer us in the right direction to make better informed choices. So if you're wondering what's going to happen in your week ahead, be sure to tune in to The Astrology Show for guidance. Mondays at 9 p.m. Eastern Time. Hi, this is Bill Maher. I can find humor in almost anything, but one thing I never laugh about is cruelty to animals. If you don't get the joke either, write People for the Ethical Treatment of Animals, 501 Front Street, Norfolk, Virginia, 23510. When I grow up, I want to be a new pair of blue jeans. When I grow up, I want to be a kid's first computer. When I grow up, I don't want to be a piece of garbage. And if you recycle me, I won't be. Give your garbage another life. Recycle. Learn how at IWantToBeRecycled.org. Brought to you by Keep America Beautiful and the Ad Council. Back on Destination Unlimited, my guest this week is Jill Sylvester. She's the author of Trust Your Intuition, 100 Ways to Transform Anxiety and Depression for Stronger Mental Health. Jill, tip number 25 is clutter cleaning. How does it help with intuition and mental health? And why is it important to remove items that trigger feelings of regret, failure, and trauma? 
because they're heavy items and they carry heavy energy. So if we're holding on to those things, we're holding on to that dead weight energy that no longer serves us. So cleaning your space and clearing your space is a great practice, if not essential practice, for becoming lighter and developing your intuition. And how do you recommend that be done? Should people give stuff away or sell it or just uh, uh, dispose of it in a proper way? Um, I think it depends on your intention. You know, I'm thinking with my own kids, um, uh, middle school and high school at the time, we went around and cleared their rooms so that they were ready for new opportunities and new school years um, and new challenges. And so we went around with a big trash bag and tossed a ton of stuff and, you know, kind of blessed it kind of thing, like, all right, thanks, this served me then, and that was great, but it's time for it to go. And then other things that were a little harder, um, you know, maybe recycle it, maybe put it somewhere else in the house um, or, you know, pass it on to somebody. But I think most of it to to toss it and just kind of like Marie Kondo does is, is say, you know, thank you for being in my life kind of thing. I appreciate when I wore that. It made me feel good, but it reminds me of a time when I was different and I'm no longer that person, so let's let it go. I think ritualistically doing that, especially with the gratitude aspect, is really important, don't you? Yes, definitely, yeah. You thank something that even if it's heavy on you now, that it did serve you in some capacity for a period of time, and you're grateful for that service, and now you're ready to let it go. Yeah, it brings a closure to it because when you just kind of go around and throw everything in a bag and get rid of it, there can tend to be some guilty feelings later about not making peace with things or maybe I should have, would have, could have, you know, done this. But if you if you take the time with each item, whether it's clothing or whether it's jewelry or whatever it is in your space, to be able to just kind of stop and reflect for a second on, you know, why you wore it or why this was in your life or who gave it to you, um, and what it meant to you at that time, and if you need it to move into the new space that you're moving into. And, you know, oftentimes you don't. So it, it becomes this, this closure, this nice kind of respect for what it represented in your life at that time, and then you can move on without it. It's, easy, it's easier to do it that way, in my opinion. And it's okay to take stuff that's usable by others and donate it and give it away, too. Oh, sure. Yeah. There's an old expression, nature abhors a vacuum, and by decluttering, you're creating the vacuum, which nature, in turn, will fill with new and important things. Yeah, you're you're clearing. You're making way for for the new. Really important. Now, what about people who are hoarders? Mm, It's a tough one. It's a tough one. Um, You know, well, clearly they have a bigger job to do. It's going to take a little longer, Um, but again, if if you're really serious about developing your intuition and raising your vibration, um, then then it's something you have to do because you're surrounding yourself with heavy, dense energy, and that energy is holding you back from that next that next move, that next um, that next chapter. So um, harder to do, but the psychological work you know needs needs to be done, and it can be done in order to to uh, to move forward. As uh, someone who has studied and practiced feng shui for many years, I can share with our listeners that when you do the decluttering and cleaning, the energy changes dramatically. You feel lighter when you've gotten rid of the stuff. So absolutely a great practice to engage in. Yeah, it's amazing. It It really feels different. It really, really does. Now, your tip 64 is something that many of us struggle with, and that's setting healthy boundaries. Why is this so important, and how do lack of boundaries cause serious mental health issues in people? Well, if you're an intuitive person by nature, um, you're somebody who feels other people's feelings. And so it's ever more important um, if you are somebody who's, who's an empath or somebody who picks up on other people's emotions or is a sensitive, mostly sensitive person, in the term, um, you need to set boundaries in order to know clearly who you are because it can, the boundary lines can get really blurred when you're not aware of your own psychic space. 
Um, and that can really skew the picture of whether it's your anxiety or it's someone else's or your anger or someone else's. So when you set the day, which I like to do with just intention, you become aware of your own energy field, so to speak, and your own space. And so it becomes a little bit easier to go out in the world and engage with people knowing what you stand for, what you believe, what you're feeling, so that when you come into contact with a person and you're feeling kind of weird and different from what you felt 10 minutes ago and then you leave that person and then you feel back to yourself, you start to understand how it's really important to set that boundary so that it doesn't get confusing. Now, a lot of our listeners are empathic and sensitive people. How would you instruct them to be, and they also like to be open to other people. They don't want to be close to other people. How can someone be compassionate and open and yet protect themselves at the same time? I think you can do a better job when you're aware of your own space to be compassionate and open to other people's, you know, um, stuff because you're, again, aware of yourself. So it isn't a closing off so much as it's a... um, protection of your own space so that if you are, let's say, feeling one way and then you come into contact with somebody at the grocery store and you start to notice your, you know, your heart rate is is speeding up, let's take that example, and you start to feel really anxious. And when you're in tune with yourself, you know, like, that's not my stuff, that's theirs. So maybe you say something kind to that person or maybe you give them a compliment or maybe you help them if they're frazzled and they're stuff has fallen all over the place and you offer to pick it up. It's it's that mindfulness, it's that um, awareness of your own boundary space that, that allows you to actually be of service to someone else in a much more productive way. And how do we deal with the EVs, the energy vampires? Mm. Um, mindfulness. Mm. Mindfulness. As soon as you start to feel like you are losing energy, or that you are drained, or that you are exhausted around being, you know, being around a certain person, um, you you got to make the choice to move away. If it's a phone call, you hang up. If you're in the space with somebody, move, move away. You know, a great excuse is I have to go to the bathroom. <laughs> I have to take this call. You know, doing something that gets you out of the space to just say you know what, That's that energy didn't feel right for me, so what am I going to do about it? Is it someone in my life that I kind of have to put up with and I have to see a lot? You know, how can I do that on a limited basis? Or is it a relationship that needs to be um, uh, dissolved altogether? Mm. Yeah, yeah. It's been said that laughter is the best medicine, and one of your concepts is to laugh. When and how should we apply this? Every day, as much as possible. Humor is everything. It's such a sign of strength. When I'm working with people and they have a good sense of humor, regardless of what is going on in their lives, I always come back to that. If you have a sense of humor, you can get through anything. So it's really important to have it. If you don't have a great sense of humor, find people around you who do so that you can you know, learn to laugh vicariously through them, you know, and and really learn how to develop that because it is a huge, huge strength, really important. I have a friend who teaches laughter yoga where people get together in a class and they just laugh hysterically for as long as they can, stop, relax for a couple of seconds and start laughing again. And it's a great exercise. Yeah, it's very healing, very cathartic. In my, uh, shall shall we say this, mature years, I've learned to apply the old adage, two ears and one mouth, listen twice and speak once. I find myself holding back from what used to be the need to always respond and listen to my inner voice telling me, not so fast, or you really don't need to say anything. How would you suggest that people apply this? When you come to practice that stillness we talked about in the very beginning and learning how to quiet yourself, um, which can be, you know, often anxiety, you you learn that as a byproduct of that new habit. You learn how to slow down and be okay with the silence. You learn how to slow down and allow the person who you're talking to to just allow them the space to express themselves. They may not need you to say anything. They may need you to just listen 
or maybe to ask a question at the end, but you become more confident when you develop the skill of being able to sit still so that you don't always have to, to engage in that impulsive reactive response. Of all of the 100 tips that you offer, which is your favorite and why? Uh, huh, that's a tough one. Um, um, I would have to say probably just being present, learning how to just be with what is in the moment and realize like everything really is okay in this moment and not to worry about the next one because when you learn how to just be and you know, kind of flow with nature kind of feeling, you the answers are there. Everything you need to know is remembered in that moment intuitively. Um, my intuitive brain uh, memory never fails me, whereas my um, my my regular memory does, you know, sometimes. Um, I find that your intuitive brain always gives you the answer when you need it, um, the right way to respond. And so when you cultivate that practice of just being in the now, then you really um, you learn that everything really is okay. What message would you like readers to take away from Trust Your Intuition? Trust yourself. You know, try not to go outside yourself so much for the answers and the approval and the validation. Um, and it is, you know, it, it's worth the effort. It's worth the effort of learning to listen to yourself and to trust that inner voice and that inner sense of wisdom because it's there and it will serve you beautifully. Her book is Trust Your Intuition. Jill Sylvester, please tell our listeners one more time where they can get your book and find out more about you and your work. Trust Your Intuition and The Land of Blue, my first uh, young adult novel, is available through Amazon, uh, in Barnes and & Nobles, and on my website, www.jillsylvester.com. And you can also find me on Facebook and Instagram at Jill underscore Sylvester. Jill, thank you so much for joining us and sharing this very important and beautiful work. Thank you so much, Victor, for having me. And thank you for joining us on Destination Unlimited. I'm Victor, the Voice Furman. Have a wonderful week.